I remember the first time I debrided a wound. The patient had a pressure injury that was covered in sloth and not getting better. I was still new and nervous. But my mentor said, if you don't remove what doesn't belong, healing will never start. So I picked up the curette and when I cleared away that layer, something changed. For those who don't know me, my name is Dr. Voltaire, a wound care physician. And in this video, I am going to show you why debridement is one of the most powerful and misunderstood tools in wound care. Debridement isn't just cleaning a wound, it's removing what's stopping the body from healing, like biofilm, sloth, and necrosis. These aren't just cosmetic problems. They block granulation, hide bacteria, and mess up your moisture balance. If you leave it there, you're putting a band-aid on top of a brick wall. Debridement removes the wall so the cells can get to work. There are five main types of debridement, and no, you don't have to memorize them but you should know when to use each. The first type is autolytic, which is when you let the body do the work. Use moisture retentive dressings to break down tissue naturally. This is great for smaller, stable wounds. Then you have mechanical debridement, which is where you use more force to debrid the tissue. Examples are irrigation or tools like soft debriders. Then you have enzymatic debridement, which is when you use topical enzymes like collagenase to break down the tissue. It's slow but steady and good for patients who can't tolerate sharp removal. Another type of debridement is biological, where you use maggots. Uh, yes, real ones. They only eat dead tissue. It's amazing and frankly underused. And finally, you have sharp and surgical. So you use a scalpel or curette to remove the tissue. You don't have to do them all, but knowing what to do and when to do it makes you a better clinician. So when should you debride? Well, when you see sloth or brown soft necrosis, when a wound has stalled, when there's odor or signs of biofilm, when there's too much tissue and the wound needs a reboot. But here's where you should reconsider. If the wound has stable dry eschar on the heel and there's no infection, if there's poor perfusion, so no blood flow means no healing, so don't create an open wound. If the patient has pain and no support for local anesthesia, you always weigh the risk versus the benefit. But in most wounds, debridement is what changes the trajectory. Let me tell you about a patient, a 76-year-old man with a venous leg ulcer that hadn't changed in two months. He had daily dressing changes, compression wraps, elevation, everything. Everything looked textbook. But when I saw the wound, it was covered in a thin layer of yellow tissue. It wasn't necrotic, but it was enough to keep the wound from progressing. So I gently debrided it with a curette, used a simple foam dressing, and saw him back in seven days. That wound had pink granulation tissue like I'd never seen before. It was like his body had been waiting for someone to clear the path. Sometimes that's all it takes, one thoughtful, sharp debridement. So here's what I want you to take away. Don't underestimate debridement. It's not a side task, it's the turning point. Learn the types of debridement, know your tools, and use your judgment. And always remember that healing starts when you remove what's holding the wound back. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, check out my next one where I talk about other barriers to wound healing. Stay informed and heal well.